Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching this episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny. And this is RJ. And today we're reviewing the second edition of The One Ring, role-playing in the world of The Lord of the Rings, based on the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> this book is published by Free League and it runs close to 240 pages. The book has nine chapters with one appendix to bind them all. I, I mean, um, an appendix at the end. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh. Boo. <laughs> we're, we're very excited for a chance to review this book. RJ and I have played in different game systems that have used Middle Earth as a setting for almost 25 years from ICE's uh, aka Rollmaster system with its memorable critical and fumble charts to Cubicle 7's Adventures in Middle Earth 5e books. So we're very happy to see that there are new Lord of the Rings role playing games uh, books being printed. Uh, RJ and I will go through each section of the book and share whether we think that RPG fans of, of Tolkien's works will appreciate this game. The first section, the prologue, is seven pages and serves to let readers know where in Middle-earth's timeline these adventures take place, and reintroduces what I felt made the first edition of One Ring special, the adventuring and fellowship phases. Yeah, there are two phases uh, or modes to the game, the adventuring phase and the fellowship phase. The adventuring phase is the traditional mode in which the game master, called the lore master in this game, uh, narrates and presents challenges to the player's characters, and the players respond to those challenges. This phase makes up the majority of the game time. But after the adventuring phase is over and the rescue is completed or the town is saved, etc., then begins the fellowship phase. In the fellowship phase, the players take control and narrate what their characters do while they rest for a season. They choose where they go, describe who they meet, and what undertakings they tackle, emerging from the downtime rested, stronger, wiser, and ready to meet new challenges. Chapter 2, Action Resolution, starts with giving the most concise information about how role-playing games work and goes straight into how dice affects the scenes of danger, knowledge, and manipulation. You roll a d12 and some d6s and add them together to beat a target number. And if you roll a 12 on, on a d12, you succeed automatically, no matter how low your numbers were. And if you roll the Eye of Sauron or an 11 on a d12, it equals zero, at least just the d12. The sixes on a d6, should you equal or beat your target number, allows you greater degrees of success. Yeah, the One Ring uses custom dice. Uh, there are feet dice and there are success dice. The feet die is the 12-sided die. Uh, where the 11 is replaced with an Eye of Sauron symbol, and the 12 is replaced with a Gandalf rune, uh, which is the G from the Kurth runes. The other sides are simply the numbers 1 through 10 as normal. Then the success die is the six-sided die, where the numbers 1 through 3 are written in outline, and the numbers 4 through 6 are written solid. Also, the six has an elvish symbol next to it, the Tengwar L, technically used in non-Elvish languages as well, but I digress. Uh, this Elvish symbol is called a success icon. When you roll the dice to overcome a challenge, first you pick the skill or combat proficiency um, that applies, and then the chosen skills attribute determines the target number that you must meet or exceed to succeed, such as 14. You roll one feet die, the 12-sided die, and a handful of skill dice, the six-sided dice. If your skill rank is three, then you'll roll three skill dice. Then you simply add up all the numbers on the dice to see if you meet the target number. But as Manny explained, if you roll a Gandalf rune on the feet die, or 12 on your own die, you automatically succeed. In addition, if you roll one or more success icons, then the success is augmented to a greater or extraordinary success. And what about that Eye of Sauron on the feet die? Uh, don't worry, it's not an auto failure. It just counts as a zero in most cases. Uh, when you're getting wounded though, you don't want to see that Eye of Sauron come up. Chapter three, Adventurers, is your character creation section. Instead of race and class that you see in other role-playing games, you get cultures and callings. If you read the Lord of the Rings books or seen the movies, then you understand that elves, humans, and dwarves have many different cultures, traditions, and history within them. And this RPG reflects that. There are six cultures to choose from. Bardings, dwarves of Durin's folk, elves of Linden, hobbits of the Shire, men of Bree, and rangers of the North. And the six callings are captain, champion, 
messenger, scholar, treasure hunter, and warden. The character sheet is dominated by skills and attributes. Uh, each character simply has three attributes, strength, heart, and wits. Each can have a value from about two to seven. Next to each attribute is a related score. So strength has endurance, which is reduced when your character is physically harmed or stressed or exhausted. Heart has hope, which you can spend to get extra dice to roll. And wits has parry, which reduces attacks against the character. Below each attribute is a list of skills that belong to that attribute's domain. Each attribute has six skills, and each skill can have zero through six ranks. For example, the travel skill belongs to the heart attribute, while the riddle skill belongs to the wits attribute. There are four combat proficiencies, axes, bows, spears, and swords, which have zero to six ranks like skills do. And then finally, there are sections to record your character's culture, calling, treasure, gear, conditions, and other scores. Now take note that there's not a lot of room to record an inventory. This game assumes you have the necessary traveling gear and you only record war gear and useful items. A useful item is an item that's associated with one skill and provides a bonus when using that skill. For example, a balm to soothe pain that is associated with the healing skill. The first and most important step in creating a character is selecting a heroic culture. The core rulebook has the six heroic cultures that Manny mentioned. The culture you select will then present sub choices for further developing your character. The next big choice is determining your character's three attributes. Your chosen culture will offer six different sets of values for your attributes, which you can pick from. The culture will then provide your starting skill ranks and provide some choices there, as well as combat proficiencies. After completing the culture options, you then choose a calling. The core rulebook has six callings that Manny mentioned. The next part is putting the player characters together and creating a company. Why are the player characters together and what is their motivation? Next, you'll choose a patron for the company. The core rulebook has six patrons to choose from and each of them grants a different ability to the party. Then you choose a location that is your company's safe haven. Your company also has a fellowship pool, which is a shared pool that all players can use to replenish their hope when adventuring. The rest of the chapter talks about um, experience points and, and, and other equipment. Chapter four, characteristics, mainly deals with skills and other items to help flesh out your character to be distinctive but the rules for endurance and hope are explained here, and I want to highlight these rules because it, it helps give the game its flavor. Hope are points you can use to help attain the roles you want and helps with virtues. Sort of what inspiration points do in D&D, except these are more connected to role playing. And if your hope falls shorter than your shadow points, your character's in danger. Exhaustion is another rule that helps give the game its flavor, being that journeying is an important element in Lord of the Rings. It is also an important element to the One Ring. Resting is probably the one way for characters to heal from being fatigued. Chapter five, Valor and Wisdom, is a short chapter that talks about name weapons and similar treasure, as well as descriptions of cultural virtues. Chapter six, Adventuring Phases, in my opinion, is what makes this game very special. It's not all about combat. Most of it is role-playing the essential elements of what makes an adventure like Lord of the Rings, like the journey's beginning and ending resolutions and interacting in a special council meeting. Although it's not the emphasis of this chapter, the rules for combat, both range and close combat, are concise and neat. During the adventuring phase, it's likely that there will be a combat scene. Combat begins with opening volleys. The number of volleys depends on the scenario. Then it moves to close quarters rounds. In each close quarters round, each character chooses their stance. For close combat, the stances are forward, open, and defensive. Forward grants bonuses to your attacks and also grants bonuses to attacks against you. And defensive grants penalties to your attacks, but also grants penalties to attacks against you. There's also one ranged combat stance called rearward for characters that are staying back from the enemies. 
Unless you're in a rearward stance, you'll become engaged with one or more enemies, which means they stay engaged with you even as you move. When attacks land, they deplete your endurance. You can choose to take half damage by being knocked back, which is useful for taking a particularly strong blow. If your attack roll contains any success icons, you can choose additional special damage effects, depending on the war gear that you're using. For example, pushing an opponent back with your shield. When your endurance gets low, you become weary. And when your endurance is zero, you fall unconscious. However, if an attack's feet dice rolls a Gandalf rune or a 10, this opens the door to a piercing blow, which tests your armor and possibly causes a life-threatening wound. So battle is mostly a test of endurance, but there are these moments of mortal danger. Finally, uh, there are other combat actions you can take depending on your stance. In forward stance, you can intimidate using your awe skill to shake the morale of your opponents. In the open stance, you can rally your comrades to give them attack bonuses. And in the defensive stance, you can protect a companion. In the rearward stance, you can aim and take extra time to prepare a shot. There are also some rules for social interactions called counsel. Simpler than a duel of wits, uh, they provide structure to the dice rolls and make it clear how skills affect the flow and outcome of the encounter. Traveling is a big part of Middle Earth flavor, uh, and there are rules for journeys, which include planning the route through or around dangerous areas, having characters in journey-related roles, and the encounters that happen along the way. Chapter 7, The Fellowship Phases, is about six pages long, but very important. This is the bridge between sessions, where your characters not only get a chance to heal and, and upgrade, but also sets up the story hooks for the next session. The lore master and the company decides how much time will pass in the context of the game before the next session, and you decide how the characters grow, recover, or train. Chapter 8, the lore master, may seem at first similar to other dungeon master's guides, but don't skip reading this. If you want to run this like Lord of Rings, then this section gives you the tools to do it. It goes on in depth to talk about the shadow. Because this is the one ring, characters can be worn down by the shadow. And there's a simple and flavorful system around that. Uh, in addition to facing dread, uh, there's also a misdeeds component for heroic characters who act in villainous ways. And there are also rules for singing and writing songs that can rouse the company and renew their purpose. Uh, this chapter also has 21 stat blocks for adversaries, ranging from evil humans to orcs to wolves to undead. And this chapter ends with details about enchanted items and about the Eye of Sauron. The last chapter, The World, is about 35 pages and does a great job in trying to summarize the, the, the entire uh, uh, Lord of the Rings setting. It does focus more on Eriador, uh, giving you NPCs and location highlights we are familiar with, like the Shire, the Prancing Pony, etc. After the ninth chapter, there's an appendix. Uh, this section should be titled, Important Information You Should Know That We Couldn't Fit in the Other Sections, uh, because there are details here about patrons like Bilbo, Gandalf, and Tom Bobadil. There's an adventure here called Star of the Mist that is fantastic. And most importantly, the nameless things. Probably the one criticism I've heard over and over again about the different Middle Earth role playing games is that there aren't enough creatures in the bestiary. The section on the nameless things solves that. As a fan of Tolkien's work, I've been very critical of attempts to make a role playing game in this setting. Uh, the One Ring is the best way to capture the aesthetic of Middle Earth. The game is designed around uh, journeying, councils, combat, and fellowship. While the second edition core rulebook seems a bit narrow in scope, uh, supplements will probably open up the world a bit more um, with new regions and heroic cultures. I think the dice system supports the game design well numerically and is simple to understand, but unfortunately, I'm not crazy about the use of custom dice in games. Uh, you can use your own dice, uh, and there is an explanation of how to do that, uh, but then you're mentally mapping your dice to their special dice, which just adds to your cognitive load and makes the mechanics a tiny bit harder. But overall, I think this is the best published Middle-earth role-playing game. I think fans of the first edition One Ring 
role-playing game as well as the adventures of middle earth for 5e will enjoy this book um it's it, it carries a lot of similar the the, the ideas of, of fellowship phases adventuring phases all, all the same uh, thematic elements overall i am very happy to have this i'm glad this exists and honestly i can't wait to play it i i i miss playing one ring and it's been a while so everyone out there um thank you for watching uh, let us know um feel free to share with us your favorite parts of Lord of Rings, uh, whether it be a battle scene or or something in the books that you enjoyed. Um, be safe, take care, have a great day.